Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for September 13th through 19th, 2021. This is covering Doctrine and Covenants, sections 102 to 105. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, Scriptures. So nice to see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 47 minutes, 30 seconds. Oh, okay. Now. Wow. Here's some interesting information. This is not only the longest reading we've had so far this year. This is the longest reading that we'll have all year. Wow. So this is the big one. All right. You've been preparing all year for this moment. Okay, so what would it be daily if we broke it down daily? It would be six minutes, 47 seconds. Still super easy. Right. So take your time, have fun with your family, and jump into these sections. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it section by section. And here we've got the chart about where the revelations have happened this year and the time frame for the ones we're going to talk about today. Well, let's jump in to section 102. For our introduction, we're going to take a look at a paragraph from the seminary manual. It says, By January 1834, the church had grown to over 3,000 members. This growth created a need for additional leadership to manage the affairs of the church. On February 17, 1834, 24 high priests gathered in Joseph Smith's home for a conference in which the first high council of the church was organized. Orson Hyde, the clerk of the meeting, noted that the high council may have made some errors in the minutes of the meeting. Therefore, the council voted that the prophet should make any necessary corrections. Joseph Smith spent the next day, February 18th, making an inspired revision of those initial minutes. The minutes were amended and accepted the following day, February 19th. Now found in Doctrine and Covenants 102, these minutes outline the establishment of high councils and provide direction for stake presidencies and high councils when they administer discipline for people who have committed serious transgressions. There's an additional note found in the Institute Manual. In 1835, verses 30 through 32 were added to the minutes recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 102 in preparation for the printing of the Doctrine and Covenants. These verses illustrate a difference between decisions made by temporary high councils organized in remote locations and those made by the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, which was organized in February of 1835. Great clarification. Now, the seminary manual uses this story, and I'd like to use this story that was shared by President Harold B. Lee to give a framework for what we're being taught in Section 102. Let's take a look at the beginning of the story. He says, some years ago, I served as a stake president. We had a very grievous case that had to come before the high council and the stake presidency that resulted in the excommunication of a man who had harmed a lovely young girl. After a nearly all-night session that resulted in that action, I went to my office rather weary the next morning and was confronted by a brother of this man whom we met with in council the night before. This man said, I want to tell you that my brother wasn't guilty of what you charged him with. How do you know he wasn't guilty? I asked. Because I prayed and the Lord told me he was innocent, the man answered. Hmm. Now, what a challenging situation. What is to be done? How are we to manage a situation like this? Let's take a look at what we learn in the section and what principles we can find that will help us to understand what could be done. So in verse 1, it defines a high council as a group of 12 high priests presided over by one or three presidents. In the church today, a stake president and his counselors preside over a high council. Although the first presidency presided over the council back then, as church membership increased, Stakes were organized, and stake presidencies and high councils were called to administer the church within their individual stake boundaries. And that's the way that we do it today. In verse 2, 
The High Council was appointed by revelation for the purpose of settling important difficulties which might arise in the Church, which could not be settled by the Church or the Bishop's Council to the satisfaction of the parties. Now, important difficulties here generally refers to situations in which members have committed serious transgression, much like the story that Jay is reading from President Lee. Right. Now, going on, verses 6 through 11, these verses explain how a high council is to operate when all of its members are not present. Now, in verses 12 through 14, members of a high council are chosen to speak by casting lots. We'll explain a little bit more of the responsibilities of those who speak, but I can tell you from being in this experience that what happens is pieces of paper numbered 1 to 12 are passed out randomly to the members of the high council. And so each one has a number that's randomly given to them. And that's what it means here in this situation. The council members draw numbers 1 to 12. And so every person will have a number randomly assigned to them. Now, they are to speak in this order from 1 to 12, from either two members to as many as six members, depending on the difficulty of the case. Verses 15 through 19 explain why. Verse 15, the accused in all cases has a right to one half of the council to prevent insult or injustice. And the counselors appointed to speak before the council are to present the case after the evidence is examined in its true light before the council, and every man is to speak according to equity and justice. Those counselors who draw even numbers, that is 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and 12, are the individuals who are to stand up in behalf of the accused and prevent insult and injustice. In all cases, the accuser and the accused shall have a privilege of speaking for themselves before the council after the evidences are heard and the counselors who are appointed to speak on the case have finished their remarks. So just to summarize, it is set up so that the high council acts as a support in half for the accuser and in half for the accused so that each has an equal number of counselors who are on their side or trying to make sure that things are spoken of regarding their situation in equity and justice. Now, verse 19 tells us that after the evidences are heard, the counselors, accuser, and accused have spoken. The president shall give a decision according to the understanding which he shall have of the case and call upon the 12 counselors to sanction the same by their vote. There was an important promise that I found in the Institute Manual, a quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This comes from a talk in October 1990 General Conference where he says, quote, I wish to assure you that I think there is never a judgment rendered until after prayer has been had. Action against a member is too serious a matter to result from the judgment of men alone and particularly of one man alone. There must be the guidance of the Spirit, earnestly sought for and then followed, if there is to be justice, end quote. Nice. But going back to the section, verses 20 through 22, these verses give instructions about what to do if there is uncertainty about the decision. Verse 23 tells us, In case of difficulty respecting doctrine or principle, if there is not a sufficiency written to make the case clear to the minds of the council, the president may inquire and obtain the mind of the Lord by revelation. Verses 27 through 34 mention that the decisions of a state disciplinary council can be appealed to the first presidency. Right. Now, knowing this, all that we've just read and summarized, what confidence does this give you in these disciplinary councils? And today we call them membership councils. Let's finish our story from President Harold B. Lee. He says, I asked him to come into the office, and we sat down. I asked, would you mind if I ask you a few personal questions? He said, certainly not. How old are you? Forty-seven. What priesthood do you hold? He said he thought he was a teacher. Do you keep the word of wisdom? Well, no. Do you pay your tithing? 
He said no, and he didn't intend to as long as that blankety-blank-blank man was the bishop of the 32nd Ward. I said, do you attend your priesthood meetings? He replied, no, sir. You don't attend your sacrament meetings either? No, sir. Do you have your family prayers? He said, no. Do you study the scriptures? He said, well, his eyes were bad and he couldn't read very much. President Lee then went on to describe how a radio works and how it only gets a signal if the little delicate instruments or electrical devices on the inside are well maintained. Otherwise, we can hear nothing. He goes on, Now I said, You and I have within our souls something like what might be said to be a counterpart of these radio tubes. We might have what we call a go-to-sacrament meeting tube, keep the word of wisdom tube, pay your tithing tube, have your family prayers tube, read the scriptures tube, and as one of the most important that might be said to be the master tube of our whole soul, we might call the keep yourselves morally clean tube. If one of these becomes worn out by disuse or inactivity, if we fail to keep the commandments of God, It has the same effect upon our spiritual selves as a worn-out tube has in a radio. Now then, I said, fifteen of the best living men in the Pioneer Stake prayed last night. They heard the evidence, and every man was united in saying that your brother was guilty. Now, you, who do none of these things, you say you prayed, and you got an opposite answer. How would you explain that? Then this man gave an answer that I think was a classic. He said, Well, President Lee, I think I must have gotten my answer from the wrong source. (laughs) Now, this story can be found in a few different places, but one of them is in the teachings of Harold B. Lee, but also there's a BYU devotional on the 15th of October, 1952. It's a powerful story for me because it reminds me that the Lord isn't putting the fate of the members of his church into just anybody's hands. Not only is he choosing good and righteous people to help lead his church, but then he gives them a mantle of authority and works with them to help his will to come forth. I just think it's an amazing way for this kind of thing to work in the church. And it's an amazing testament to the divine nature of his church with the organization of councils. Yeah. It's not a decision of one man. All of these people have to be united in their spiritual reception of the decisions made. Yeah. And that makes it much more difficult for people to just make personally driven decisions. Yeah, All must be united by the reception of the Spirit. Well, yeah, and, you know, what's great is that within any program, it won't be perfect, but there is an appeal process. I just think that to set it up like this shows great love and great trust from Heavenly Father for us. So, pretty exciting. Absolutely. Well, let's go on to Doctrine and Covenants, Section 103. We'll get our background information from the Institute Manual. When the saints living in Jackson County, Missouri were driven from their homes in late 1833. Many of them found refuge across the Missouri River in Clay County, Missouri. The Prophet Joseph Smith learned of these saints' circumstances through letters he received from them. In early January 1834, Parley P. Pratt and Lyman White volunteered to travel from Missouri to Kirtland, Ohio, to talk to Joseph Smith in person and give him details about the saints' condition in Missouri. On February 24, 1834, the Prophet Joseph Smith, the newly created Kirtland High Council, which we just talked about, and others met to hear from Parley P. Pratt and Lyman White, and the group discussed how the saints might be returned to their homes in Jackson County. The Prophet stated that he was determined to go to Missouri to help redeem Zion, and approximately 30 to 40 persons who were present in the meeting also committed to go. Sometime that same day, the Prophet Joseph Smith received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 103. It was seen in part as the continued fulfillment of the prophecy given six months earlier, in which the Lord indicated that the Prophet would lead the strength of mine house unto the land of my vineyard and redeem my vineyard. 
We talked about that in Doctrine and Covenants 101, our last lesson. Right. In obedience to the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 103, church leaders traveled for several weeks among many congregations of the saints, gathering funds and supplies and recruiting volunteers to assist in an expedition that was originally known as the Camp of Israel and later called Zion's Camp. Ah, Zion's Camp. Now, even though this revelation is given regarding the enemies of the church in Joseph's day, consider what principles we might learn to help us overcome such enemies today. Good. That's a great lens. Let's start right away in verse 1 then. Verily I say unto you, my friends, behold, I will give unto you a revelation and commandment that you may know how to act in the discharge of your duties concerning the salvation and redemption of your brethren who have been scattered on the land of Zion, being driven and smitten by the hands of mine enemies, on whom I will pour out my wrath without measure in mine own time. For I have suffered them thus far, that they might fill up the measure of their iniquities, that their cup might be full, and that those who call themselves after my name might be chastened for a little season with a sore and grievous chastisement, because they did not hearken altogether unto the precepts and commandments which I gave unto them. So we've got a couple of things right here which can help us to understand the purpose of why persecutions might prevail in a situation. One of them is in verse 3, so that essentially the guilt of the unrighteous might be full, that they might be correctly charged for their iniquities, but also for the righteous or for those who have been called after the name of Christ, that they might be chastised if they didn't hearken to the commandments and the precepts, all of them that God has given. Now, what do we need to do to prevail? Let's look at verse 5. But verily I say unto you that I have decreed a decree which my people shall realize, inasmuch as they hearken from this very hour unto the counsel which I, the Lord their God, shall give them. Behold, they shall, for I have decreed it, begin to prevail against mine enemies from this very hour. And by hearkening to observe all the words which I, the Lord their God, shall speak unto them, they shall never cease to prevail until the kingdoms of the world are subdued under my feet, and the earth is given unto the saints to possess it for ever and ever. Nice. Now this is a powerful promise. And if this seems far-fetched to you, I want you to consider the size of the church in 1834 (laughs) when this was given and the size now. And a really important point there is what is our perspective? Is our perspective a day, a week, a month, a year? We can look back on this situation and absolutely see the hand of the Lord overcoming the persecutors of the church. But I don't know how clear it was to all the people at the time. And one reason might be that we all still need to work to be as obedient as sometimes we need to be to receive those blessings. Let's take a look in verses 8 through 10 to see what happens if we don't keep the commandments. Verse 8, But inasmuch as they keep not my commandments and hearken not to observe all my words, the kingdoms of the world shall prevail against them. For they were set to be a light unto the world and to be the saviors of men. And inasmuch as they are not the saviors of men, they are as salt that has lost its savor, and is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. So, to summarize, if we disobey the Lord's commandments, the world will prevail against us. If we do not observe all the Lord's words, we lose the ability to be a light to others. There was a quote that I found in the Institute Manual from President Gordon B. Hinckley, which gives us an important admonition in addition to these verses. This comes from an article called Pursue the Steady Course in the January 2005 Enzyme. He says, quote, While the world's standards generally may totter, we of the church are without excuse if we drift in the same manner. We have standards, sure, tested, and effective. 
To the extent that we observe them, we shall go forward. To the extent that we neglect them, we shall hinder our own progress and bring embarrassment to the work of the Lord. These standards have come from Him. Some of them may appear a little out of date in our society, but this does not detract from their validity nor diminish the virtue of their application. The subtle reasoning of men, no matter how clever, no matter how plausible it may sound, cannot abridge the declared wisdom of God. End quote. Nice. So in verses 11 through 20, the Lord promises the saints that after their tribulations, Zion would be redeemed by his power. However, if the saints polluted their inheritances they would be removed from them. And let's take a look at verse 21. Verily, verily, I say unto you that my servant Joseph Smith Jr. is the man to whom I likened the servant to whom the Lord of the vineyard spake in the parable which I have given unto you. Therefore, let my servant Joseph Smith Jr. say unto the strength of my house, my young men and the middle-aged, Gather yourselves together unto the land of Zion, upon the land which I have bought with money that has been consecrated unto me, and let all the churches send up wise men with their monies and purchase lands, even as I have commanded them. So this group of men whom Joseph Smith would lead to Missouri came to be known as Zion's Camp. And an interesting side note, if you look up the word camp in the 1828 Webster's Dictionary, camp is another word for army. Nice. That gives us a good sense of what the purpose is. The members of Zion's camp had two main purposes. First, they were to bring resources to the saints in Missouri to provide relief and enable them to return to their homes and purchase additional land. Second, as authorized by Governor Daniel Dunklin of Missouri, after the Missouri State Militia had escorted the saints back to Jackson County, the members of Zion's camp would be left to help maintain order and peace there. So that seems really good, if it all worked out that way. Now let's take a look at verse 20 and 27 and 28, and look at the promise. Verse 20, But I say unto you, mine angels shall go up before you, and also my presence, and in time ye shall possess the goodly land. Jumping to verse 27, Let no man be afraid to lay down his life for my sake. For whoso layeth down his life for my sake shall find it again. And whoso is not willing to lay down his life for my sake is not my disciple. Now for the saints in Zion's camp, the possibility of losing their lives was real. While we might not face the same peril, this truth can still apply to us. Absolutely. There's a quote from the Institute Manual from President James E. Faust. This comes from October 2006 General Conference, where he assures us, quote, For most of us, what is required is not to die for the church, but to live for it. For many, living a Christ-like life every day may be even more difficult than laying down one's life, end quote. Great. Now, in verses 30 through 34, the Lord explains that he desires 500 men. But he says, men do not always do my will, in verse 31. So, if not, then 100 men would be the minimum. The seminary manual gives a summary of what happens next. At the end of the high council meeting in which church leaders discussed the situation of the Missouri saints, Joseph Smith said that he would travel to Zion and help redeem it. Approximately 30 or 40 of the men present also volunteered. Then the Lord assigned eight men to go throughout congregations of the church to recruit volunteers for Zion's camp and to seek contributions of provisions and money for the saints in Missouri. About 200 people went with Zion's camp, including some women and children. Hmm. And going back to the section, verse 35, Therefore, as I said unto you, ask, and ye shall receive. Pray earnestly that peradventure my servant Joseph Smith Jr. may go with you and preside in the midst of my people and organize my kingdom upon the consecrated land and establish the children of Zion upon the laws and commandments which have been and which shall be given unto you. All victory and glory is brought to pass unto you through your diligence and faithfulness. 
and prayers of faith. Now, interesting side note about this revelation, this was not included in the 1835 edition of the Doctrine and Covenants. It would be included later in the 1844 edition. Nice. Well, that ends section 103, but it doesn't end our discussion of Zion's camp. Not hardly. Yeah, so let's take a look, though, at our next revelation. That's section 104. The seminary manual gives us an introduction. In the spring of 1834, the church was having financial difficulties and efforts to collect funds for its relief had failed. In March 1832, church leadership in Ohio had established an organization called the United Firm to manage the church's commercial, mercantile, and business interests in a way that would help establish Zion and care for the poor. We talked about this back in Section 78 and in other places. In April 1832... Joseph Smith and others had met with the church leaders in Missouri and organized a branch of the United Firm in Jackson County. This was in Section 82. These two branches, one in Ohio and one in Missouri, had continued for two years. Some additional background from the Institute Manual. Because of mob violence in Missouri in 1833, William W. Phelps's printing office in Jackson County had been destroyed, and Sidney Gilbert was forced to close his storehouse. Consequently, neither the printing office nor the store could produce income for the firm. But the firm still had to repay the debts it had acquired to establish and supply these businesses. In Ohio, United Firm members increasingly became indebted to New York companies as they borrowed money to supply the Kirtland storehouse and to purchase land and a new printing press in Kirtland. In addition, some of the firm's members manifested a covetous spirit toward the firm's property, for which they were responsible. Because of these difficulties, members of the Kirtland branch of the United Firm met on the 10th of April, 1834, and decided that the firm should be dissolved, and each one receive a stewardship or property to oversee and manage. About two weeks later, the Prophet Joseph Smith received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 104, which contained further instructions from the Lord regarding the United Firm and its properties. Now, as a side note, Joseph Smith later directed that the term United Firm be replaced with United Order in the published revelation. Let's start with verse 1. Verily I say unto you, my friends, I give unto you counsel and a commandment concerning all the properties which belong to the order which I commanded to be organized and established, to be a united order, and an everlasting order for the benefit of my church, and for the salvation of men until I come, with promise immutable and unchangeable, that inasmuch as those whom I commanded were faithful, they should be blessed with a multiplicity of blessings. But inasmuch as they were not faithful, they were nigh unto cursing. Therefore, inasmuch as some of my servants have not kept the commandment, but have broken the covenant through covetousness and with feigned words. I have cursed them with a very sore and grievous curse. Now, as a note, covetousness refers to a selfish desire of possessing something, usually something that belongs to someone else. And in verse 4, it uses the term feigned words, and that means invented or insincere words. From the Institute Manual, there's a really great quote from Elder Joseph B. Worthlin. This is from April 2004 General Conference where he talks about covetousness. He says, quote, Brothers and sisters, beware of covetousness. It is one of the great afflictions of these latter days. It creates greed and resentment. Often it leads to bondage, heartbreak, and crushing, grinding debt. End quote. Great point. Now, in verses 5 through 10, the Lord decreed that the consequences for breaking the covenant associated with the United Order would include being cursed and being cut off from the church. Now, this is instruction that we also saw in Doctrine and Covenants 78 and in 82. Let's continue in verse 11. It is wisdom in me, therefore, a commandment I give unto you, that ye shall organize yourselves and appoint every man his stewardship, that every man may give an account unto me of the stewardship which is appointed unto him. For it is expedient that I, the Lord, should make every man accountable, 
as a steward over earthly blessings, which I have made and prepared for my creatures. This is interesting to me because it clarifies who actually owns this stuff. Right. All of the things that they are trying to organize and to take care of and have stewardships over, these things are all the Lord's. And to drive that point home much more clearly, let's go back to the Revelation, verse 14. I, the Lord, stretched out the heavens and built the earth, my very handiwork, and all things therein are mine. And it is my purpose to provide for my saints, for all things are mine. But it must needs be done in mine own way. And behold, this is the way that I, the Lord, have decreed to provide for my saints, that the poor shall be exalted, in that the rich are made low. For the earth is full, and there is enough and to spare. Yea, I prepared all things, and have given unto the children of men to be agents unto themselves. Therefore, if any man shall take of the abundance which I have made, and impart not his portion, according to the law of my gospel, unto the poor and the needy, he shall, with the wicked, lift up his eyes in hell, being in torment. Wow. Now, from the Institute Manual, there's a quote from Elder Joseph B. Worthland. This comes from April 1999 General Conference, in which he clarifies the notion of the poor are exalted and the rich are made low. He says, quote, The Lord's way consists of helping people help themselves. The poor are exalted because they work for the temporary assistance they receive, they are taught correct principles, and they are able to lift themselves from poverty to self-reliance. The rich are made low because they humble themselves to give generously of their means to those in need. End quote. And this reminds me of my favorite quote from President Ezra Taft Benson, and we've quoted it a few times on the show. This was originally from October 1985 General Conference, but was more recently quoted by Elder David A. Bednar in April 2020. He says, quote, The Lord works from the inside out. The world works from the outside in. The world would take people out of the slums. Christ takes the slums out of people, and then they take themselves out of the slums. The world would mold men by changing their environment. Christ changes men, who then change their environment. The world would shape human behavior, but Christ can change human nature. End quote. Wow. I love that. Wow. So we are accountable to use what the Lord has given us to help others. In verses 19 through 53, this is a big chunk. The Lord is giving specific instructions about the stewardships assigned to the members of the United Order. But take a look at the consistency of the promise, like in verses 23, 25, 31, 33, 35, 38, 42, and 46. We see this phrase, in as much as, which means insofar as or to the extent that. So what is it that in as much as? Again and again, the Lord promises that in as much as we are humble and faithful, the Lord will multiply our blessings. That promise is given over and over again in these verses. What a great promise. Now, in verses 54 through 77, the Lord provided instructions for establishing treasuries to safeguard funds that would be used for the benefit of the church, such as in printing the scriptures. In verse 78, And again, verily I say unto you, concerning your debts, behold, it is my will that you shall pay all your debts. Now, do you remember our introduction? This must have seemed absolutely impossible. Well, as impossible as it may have seemed, this is counsel that is still given to us today. From that same talk in April 2004 General Conference, the Institute Manual shares this quote from Elder Joseph B. Worthland, where he says, quote, Honor your financial obligations. From time to time, we hear stories of greed and selfishness that strike us with great sorrow. We hear of fraud, defaulting on loan commitments, financial deceptions, and bankruptcies. We are a people of integrity. 
We believe in honoring our debts and being honest in our dealings with our fellow men. End quote. Great way to look at it. And also from the Institute Manual, there's a favorite quote from President Gordon B. Hinckley. This is from October 1998 General Conference. This quote is particularly meaningful to my wife and I. It was very impactful to us at the time it was given. He said, quote, So many of our people are living on the very edge of their incomes. In fact, some are living on borrowings. I urge you to look to the condition of your finances. I urge you to be modest in your expenditures. Discipline yourselves in your purchases to avoid debt to the extent possible. Pay off debt as quickly as you can and free yourselves from bondage. This is a part of the temporal gospel in which we believe, end quote. So that reminds me of something that we have been taught every year for the last few years, and yet this is a portion of General Conference that is very rarely, if ever, quoted. From the Church Auditing Department report from April 2021 General Conference, we are told, quote, The Church follows the practices taught to its members of living within a budget, avoiding debt, and saving against a time of need, end quote. So yes, while these principles are directed to the church at large, they are also taught to each one of us. Yeah, they certainly are. And we may look at that. Well, first of all, to be clear, it took the church a long time to get to this point. Oh, yes. So be patient with yourself, but keep working toward that goal. But as it says in verse 78, we may look at that, that we need to pay all our debts, and that may seem absolutely impossible depending on the situation that we're in. All of us have felt that bondage that comes with being in debt. So let's look in verses 80 through 82. What do you see in these verses that can help you to be successful with this commandment, to get ourselves out of bondage? Starting in verse 80. And inasmuch as you are diligent and humble and exercise the prayer of faith, behold, I will soften the hearts of those to whom you are in debt, until I shall send means unto you for your deliverance. Therefore, write speedily to New York, and write according to that which shall be dictated by my Spirit, and I will soften the hearts of those to whom you are in debt, that it shall be taken away out of their minds to bring affliction upon you. And inasmuch as ye are humble and faithful, and call upon my name, Behold, I will give you the victory. So if we are humble and faithful and call upon the Lord's name, then he will help us accomplish what he has asked us to do. And I testify of the truth of that, no matter how hopeless you feel and no matter how long it's going to take, these steps, turning to the Lord, He can help you accomplish it. Now, the Come Follow Me manual has links to a 20-minute video from 2010 about a fellow named John Tanner. It's quite a story, and I encourage you, we'll put a link in the description. It's a great testament to the kinds of principles that are being taught in section 104. Mm -hmm. So with that, let's go on to section 105, and let's get our background again from the Institute Manual. In February 1834, the Prophet Joseph Smith declared his intention to lead an expedition of men to Missouri to help church members regain their homes and lands in Jackson County. In the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 103, the Lord instructed the Prophet and seven other men to travel to outlying branches of the church to recruit volunteers willing to help redeem Zion. Although the Lord had asked them to try to recruit 500 men for the journey, The most they were able to recruit was a little more than 200 men, accompanied by approximately 12 women and 10 children. Members of the expedition organized by the Prophet Joseph Smith made preparations to go to Missouri to assist the state militia in helping the displaced saints return to their homes. The men in the expedition would then remain as a protective force in Jackson County, In early May 1834, the Prophet Joseph Smith departed with around 100 men from northeastern Ohio. 
This group was referred to as the Camp of Israel and later became known as Zion's Camp. The group traveled approximately 900 miles through Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois to Missouri. They were joined by additional men who had been recruited by Hiram Smith and Lyman White in the Michigan Territory and others who joined them on the way west. As Zion's camp traveled through northern Missouri, tension grew in Jackson County and in surrounding counties as word spread that a Mormon army was approaching. The Prophet Joseph Smith sent Parley P. Pratt and Orson Hyde to the Missouri State Capitol in Jefferson City to request the military assistance that Governor Daniel Dunklin had promised in order to help the Saints reclaim their lands in Jackson County. However, Governor Dunklin was reluctant to get involved in the matter. This meant that the Saints would not receive the protection they needed in order to regain their homes. After receiving the news that they would not receive assistance from Governor Dunklin, the members of Zion's camp proceeded toward the displaced saints who were sheltered in Clay County, Missouri, and then camped approximately 10 miles northeast of Liberty, Missouri, between two forks of the Fishing River. On June 19th, five armed men approached the camp and threatened that approximately 400 men were planning to attack the camp that night. However, the members of Zion's camp were protected when a thunderstorm dropped large hailstones and caused the fishing river to rise nearly 40 feet, preventing the mob from attacking. Members of Zion's camp viewed the storm as evidence that God was protecting them. One member of the camp, Nathan Baldwin, stated, The Lord had previously said he would fight the battles of his saints, and it seemed as though the mandate had gone forth from his presence to ply the artillery of heaven in defense of his servants. In an effort to calm the Missouri citizens, the Prophet Joseph Smith and some others in the camp signed a statement on June 21, 1834, indicating that they did not intend to commence hostilities against any man or body of men, but sought for a peaceful way for the saints to return to Jackson County. The following day, on June 22, 1834, the Prophet held a council to discuss how the camp should proceed. During the meeting, he received the revelation recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 105, which revealed that the church was no longer required to redeem the land of Zion at that time. As members of the camp learned that they would not be required to fight, some accepted it as the Lord's will, but some were upset and murmured, and some even apostatized from the church. Well, let's take a look at this revelation starting in verse 1. Verily I say unto you, who have assembled yourselves together, that you may learn my will concerning the redemption of mine afflicted people. Behold, I say unto you, were it not for the transgressions of my people, speaking concerning the church and not individuals, they might have been redeemed even now. But behold, they have not learned to be obedient to the things which I required at their hands, but are full of all manner of evil, and do not impart of their substance, as becometh saints, to the poor and afflicted among them, and are not united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom. Now, as a side note, the law of the celestial kingdom includes all of the laws, principles that we need to obey, and ordinances we need to receive, and the covenants we need to keep in order to inherit the celestial kingdom. Going on in verse 5, And Zion cannot be built up unless it is by the principles of the law of the celestial kingdom. Otherwise I cannot receive her unto myself. And my people must needs be chastened until they learn obedience, if it must needs be by the things which they suffer. The Institute Manual gives us this quote from Elder D. Todd Christofferson in October 2008 General Conference where he says, quote, As we consider the unity required for Zion to flourish, we should ask ourselves if we have overcome jarrings, contentions, envyings, and strifes. Are we individually and as a people free from strife and contention and united according to the union required by the law of the celestial kingdom? Forgiveness of one another is essential to this unity. Jesus said, I, the Lord, will forgive whom I will forgive, 
but of you it is required to forgive all men. We will become of one heart and one mind as we individually place the Savior at the center of our lives and follow those he has commissioned to lead us. End quote. Well, now speaking of the suffering that Christ talked about in verse 6, here's a short summary from the Church History in the Fullness of Time student manual. This is chapter 12. If you've got the paper manual, it's pages 143 to 45. Zion's camp marched about 900 miles, like we read, through four states, traveling between 20 and 40 miles a day for 45 days. And can I just say, that is much higher than normal travel. Mm -hmm. I've been on 20-mile-a-day hikes. This is a lot of travel in a day. Camp members experienced blistered feet, hot and humid weather conditions, food shortages, and unhealthy food. On occasion, intense thirst moved some camp members to drink swamp water from which mosquito larvae had to be strained out, sometimes using their teeth as strainers, or to drink water out of horse tracks after a rainstorm. Throughout the expedition, Zion's camp was also often threatened with violence from others. By the way, this is just a summary. If you want to get a better sense of what they endured, please check out the chapter. There is so much more information. It's incredible what they went through. Now, after all that suffering, if it was you, how would you respond to the following verses? Going back to the Revelation, then verse 9. Therefore, in consequence of the transgressions of my people, it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season for the redemption of Zion, that they themselves may be prepared and that my people may be taught more perfectly and have experience and know more perfectly concerning their duty and the things which I require at their hands. And this cannot be brought to pass until mine elders are endowed with power from on high. For behold, I have prepared a great endowment and blessing to be poured out upon them, inasmuch as they are faithful and continue in humility before me. Therefore it is expedient in me that mine elders should wait for a little season, for the redemption of Zion. For behold, I do not require at their hands to fight the battles of Zion. For as I said in a former commandment, even so will I fulfill, I will fight your battles. So then I might imagine myself saying, what did we travel all this way for? (laughs) And go through so much suffering for. What was the point? What was the point? Let's take a look in verse 18. But inasmuch as there are those who have hearkened unto my words, I have prepared a blessing and an endowment for them if they continue faithful. I have heard their prayers and will accept their offering, and it is expedient in me that they should be brought thus far for a trial of their faith. Here's another excerpt from the Church History in the Fullness of Times manual. The prophet later explained, God did not want you to fight. He could not organize his kingdom with 12 men to open the gospel door to the nations of the earth and with 70 men under their direction to follow in their tracks unless he took them from a body of men who had offered their lives and who had made as great a sacrifice as did Abraham. In February 1835, the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and the first quorum of the Seventy were organized. Nine of the original apostles, all seven presidents of the Seventies Quorum, and all 63 other members of that quorum had served in the Army of Israel that marched to western Missouri in 1834. In verses 20 through 37, the Lord told the saints in Missouri how they were to respond to the persecution they were experiencing while awaiting the future redemption of Zion. He counseled them to be humble and avoid stirring up contention. He explained that they needed to be sanctified in preparation for the eventual redemption of Zion. In verse 38, the Lord says, And again I say unto you, sue for peace, not only to the people that have smitten you, but also to all people. And lift up an ensign of peace, and make a proclamation of peace unto the ends of the earth, and make proposals for peace unto those who have smitten you, 
according to the voice of the Spirit which is in you, and all things shall work together for your good. Therefore be faithful, and behold, and lo, I am with you, even unto the end. Even so. Amen. The Institute Manual gives a quote from then-elder Dallin H. Oaks from an Enzyme article in February 2013 called Balancing Truth and Tolerance, where he emphasizes that same admonition in verse 38. He says, quote, We must practice tolerance and respect toward others. We should be alert to honor the good we should see in all people and in many opinions and practices that differ from our own. That approach to differences will yield tolerance and also respect toward us. Our tolerance and respect for others and their beliefs does not cause us to abandon our commitment to the truths we understand and the covenants we have made. We must stand up for truth, even while we practice tolerance and respect for beliefs and ideas different from our own and for the people who hold them, end quote. Good counsel. Well, and one more thought where this is concerned, Doctrine and Covenants 105 was also not included in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, but was later included in the 1844. Nice. I just think it's interesting that the leadership of the church receives revelation and these revelations are not necessarily meant to be published as a book of Scripture, but could later on. Yep. President Joseph Fielding Smith has made statements to this effect, but others have implied it as well. Not all revelations that the church leadership has received have been published in the Doctrine and Covenants or other works. Yeah. So one last note on Zion's camp. The Come Follow Me lesson has another Voices of the Restoration section for this lesson. And these are really great. You should really read these as a family. We'd like to read a couple of them here. Yeah, let me take Brigham Young. He says, When we arrived in Missouri, the Lord spoke to his servant Joseph and said, I have accepted your offering. And we had the privilege to return again. On my return, many friends asked me what profit there was in calling men from their labor to go up to Missouri and then return without apparently accomplishing anything. Who has it benefited? Asked they. If the Lord did command it to be done, what object had he in view in doing so? I told those brethren that I was well paid, paid with heavy interest, yea, that my measure was filled to overflowing with the knowledge that I had received by traveling with the prophet. Powerful. And from Wilford Woodruff, I was in Zion's camp with the prophet of God. I saw the dealings of God with him. I saw the power of God with him. I saw that he was a prophet. What was manifest to him by the power of God upon that mission was of great value to me and to all who received his instructions. When the members of Zion's camp were called, many of us had never beheld each other's faces. We were strangers to each other, and many had never seen the prophet. We had been scattered abroad like corn sifted in a sieve throughout the nation. We were young men and were called upon in that early day to go up and redeem Zion. And what we had to do, we had to do by faith. We assembled together from the various states at Kirtland and went up to redeem Zion in fulfillment of the commandment of God unto us. God accepted our works as he did the works of Abraham. We accomplished a great deal, though apostates and unbelievers many times asked the question, What have you done? We gained an experience that we never could have gained in any other way. We had the privilege of beholding the face of the prophet, and we had the privilege of traveling a thousand miles with him and seeing the workings of the Spirit of God with him and the revelations of Jesus Christ unto him and the fulfillment of those revelations. And he gathered some two hundred elders from throughout the nation in that early day and sent us broadcast into the world to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Had I not gone up with Zion's camp, I should not have been here today in Salt Lake City, serving in the Quorum of the Twelve. 
By going there, we were thrust into the vineyard to preach the gospel, and the Lord accepted our labors. And in all our labors and persecutions, with our lives often at stake, we have had to work and live by faith. The experience we obtained in traveling in Zion's camp was of more worth than gold. Nice. So if you're interested in learning more about Zion's camp, don't forget the many resources available. Let me start you with a few. We'll link them in the description. First, the historical resources. We've talked about this before. It's in your Gospel Library app, and it tries to collect for each Come Follow Me week other resources together in one place. So here we have pictures, we have texts and backgrounds. Look, there's a picture of Brigham Young's thimble that he used in Zion's camp to mend a tear in his tent. There are different people you can get biographies for, different historical backgrounds. But notice that it has the chapters that you would want to read if you wanted to read the story of Zion's camp from the book Saints. You can see here chapters 18, 19, 22, 26. It has them linked right here. And the book Saints is a great narrative way to go through this story. And I've already referenced Church History in the Fullness of Chimes, chapter 12. Wonderful. So Church History topics, lots of things, all collected together in this one section. And if you want a video, back in 2010 for the seminary resources, they did create a video on Zion's camp. I really like it. It's about 20 minutes long. But from it comes the great line that was given to Jesse J. Smith, one of Joseph's cousins, his character, as he's speaking to young George Albert Smith, who was along. The God of Israel leads the camp. So it's a great perspective. It covers all the things we've talked about today and gives some good visuals. You'll have seen them if you were watching the video version of this. So the link will be in the description. Check it out. Watch it with your family. Discuss all the things that you've learned. What an incredible time and an incredible experience for the early church. Well, that was an amazing lesson yeah. and an amazing journey so far. But there is still more to come. Always. Remember that the church is just barely four years old. Wow. So much more to come. Keep reading your scriptures, and we'll look forward to talking to you more about these revelations in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But we're really big fans. <laughs>